fuck is Wrestling Roundtable? Wrestling Roundtable Radio is now live back on the air at blogtalkradio.com slash wrestling roundtable simulcast on gfl.tv. That's Go Fight Live. You can simulcast it yourself, too, if you get the embedding code on Blog Talk Radio. The number to call is 347-857-4647 to share your thoughts, opinions, questions, whatever's on your mind with the panel, which will be introduced momentarily. I am the host, Eric Santa Maria. Been working in wrestling now over seven years. Seven years doing a lot of different things, mainly videography, but I've done everything from ring crew, spotlight, working backstage, working in front of the camera, done a lot of stuff. We want to encourage you, of course, to join us on WrestlingRoundtable.com. Now, some of the new content on the website, our latest radio shows, not just on YouTube, but also Go Fight Live, iTunes, and Blog Talk Radio. Yes, we are not maintaining WrestlingRoundtablePodcast.com any longer. If you want audio versions of the show, and you can get every single show we've ever done. That's almost 40 radio shows. This is our 38th. And 54 so far, 55 is coming up, but 54 video shows. You can get all those in audio form on iTunes. If you go into iTunes... In the search box, type Wrestling Roundtable, and you'll get our entire archive. Same for Blog Talk Radio. So thank you for showing an interest in the show. Now, while you're at WrestlingRoundtable.com, also a new Fall Brawl 96 recap. Yes, the WCW pay-per-view featuring war games with the NWO and their first war games against WCW's team recapped by Anthony Amon on the website. Speaking of WCW... The Invasion show we did earlier this year to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the WWF buying WCW, we did the Invasion rebooking, and you can get all the details of my re-envisioned WWF 2001 scenario, along with Will Brooks's and Orlando O'Neill's, while we're mentioning it, at WrestlingRoundTable.com. Now, I also want to mention that you should go to the Wrestling Roundtable shop because you can get Pro Wrestling Respect DVDs. Gerald Bynum, Jamal Reynolds, other callers who have called into the show before have done so. So show some support for the show, too. Get the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt while you're at it, because this show ain't free to do. And until this starts becoming, I guess, let's say, our full-time job, (laughs) we're going to need your support. I said on a recent show, we're like the PBS of wrestling talk shows and MMA talk shows because this is brought to you by viewers like you and it ain't free, it ain't cheap and unless we get financial support it ain't going to be around forever. We need your support like I said. So, if you're going to click through on our ads to buy a show at Go Fight Live, if you want to get a Ring of Honor, AAW, other sort of pro wrestling, mixed martial arts or boxing eye pay-per-view from Go Fight Live, click through our ads and we have the Amazon shop as well. Holidays are upon us. Halloween was just yesterday. Thanksgiving, of course, coming up next. But Christmas, Hanukkah, and all the other winter solstice holidays are coming up where people exchange gifts in the residuals of pagan rituals. So get your holiday shopping at Amazon.com store on WrestlingRoundTable.com so we can get a cut of it. Now, before I get to the panelists wanted to mention a couple things that we have coming up. First of all, the Q&A for submission round number five. We're trying to schedule the next taping for, I guess it'll be our season finale for season four, and I hope we can do the submission round five then. It's looking to be around December, I would say, about now, a little later than I'd hoped. But submission round five Q&A, the difference this time, though, is we want to see your face. We want to hear your questions on a video response. You can make it a video response on YouTube or you can send it in to WrestlingRoundtable at gmail.com. We've gotten a few questions already and they're good ones, so follow suit with some of the predecessors and we'll see your face as you join the roundtable on the submission round five coming up in our season finale. So let's get to the rest of the panel. Up first is Coriander Ake in Chicago. Hey, Corey. Hey, Eric. Hello, everyone. Up next is Will Evan Brooks, one half of the Battle of Wills. Will Brooks has joined the panel. Hey, Will. Hello, everybody. I had a great time on Halloween. I got to be Zack Ryder. 
It was a lot of fun. No one recognized me, though, but it was okay. It's okay. But I want to say this. Eric, you're kind of lucky I'm being here. I'm still in the contract for one more radio appearance because we did walk out on you. I don't have any confidence in you. I still don't. But I'm, and I'm, neither I'm does the audience, man, apparently. I'm a man of my word, and I said I'll be here for one more appearance. Here I am. Amira in Baltimore. You joined us on our panel last time for Mixed Martial Arts, and I've invited you back because I was impressed with your insight. And let's also mention, because I did mention it in passing, but you also have a Muay Thai background, I said. You still train in Muay Thai. You describe yourself as the sweetest girl to ever punch you in the face. And let's hear some more about that. Uh, what's your experience so far? I've been training for a little over two years. Also have a little bit of jiu-jitsu training, but mostly Muay Thai. I haven't done active competition yet. I've been looking for a fight, but it's a little hard to find something in my weight class because I'm small. Yeah, I've been training with full contact sparring and everything for a couple of years now. All right. Well, thanks for joining our panel, and we're going to move on to mixed martial arts first. Up first is the UFC's latest show, which was 137 this past Saturday at Las Vegas, Nevada's Mandalay Bay. And I know a lot of people, Amira, were of the mindset that once GSP dropped out of this a few weeks ago, they weren't going to buy it. Of course, the card shuffled a lot with the Nick Diaz, BJ Penn, GSP, Carlos Condit situation. But once that was out of the lineup, BJ Penn, Nick Diaz was the main event. And aside from that, I thought it was a good lineup regardless, so I definitely made sure to watch it. But the first fight I wanted to mention was a free fight on the prelims on Spike. And that was the lightweight bout between Donald Cerrone and Germany's Dennis Siever. Cerrone really quickly got his fourth win in UFC. He just debuted this year, and he's already had four victories. He's going for five now. He'll be fighting on the last card of the year with Lesnar Overeem. But this was a first-round submission with a rear naked choke. They're already starting to push him into the, I guess, upper echelon of the already stacked lightweight division. How can we even fathom, Amira, who is really in contention. Obviously, with coming up on the 12th, Ben Henderson and Clay Guida, you would think that that would likely be for a number one contendership. But then what about everyone else, like Donald Cerrone and everyone else in the division? Plus, what if they throw Gilbert Melendez into the mix? So it's incredible how stacked this division is. And just looking at the cards they have coming up, not even just the rest of the year, some of the fights we found out that are going to be happening in the Brazil show in January with Jose Aldo's next title defense, Anthony Rumble Johnson moving up to middleweight and fighting Vitor Belfort, and then, of course, Super Bowl weekend, which we'll get to. It really shows the depth of the divisions in UFC. Their roster is really just incredible to the point where you can have cards shuffle, fights lined up, and guys get hurt. And then when someone does drop out, they even fill it with something awesome instead. Just look at how this main event card ended up in and of itself. What are your thoughts on Donald Cerrone's rise in the lightweight division and UFC? Because I know you're a WEC fan, and I guess the lightweight division in general. I love Donald Cerrone. He's one of my favorites from WEC. And I think that even though most of his UFC fights have been on prelims or Facebook fights or versus shows and whatever, he's actually, I think, the guy who's made the best transition from WEC to UFC. And the one weakness that he seemed to have in the past was that tendency to start slow. But as we saw in this fight, he's definitely overcome that. And I really can't wait to see him start getting fights with higher profile guys. My guess would be with the lightweight division that it'll either be Melendez or winner of Guida Henderson. Probably more likely if Guido wins that, that they will give it to him than Henderson. But I would say it's going to come out of one of, one of those two. Well, what do you think of the criticism on giving Melendez an immediate title shot in the sense that a lot of people say, Rodney has said it on the show before, that the level of competition in strike force does not match up to UFC. So why should a champion in strike force be guaranteed an immediate title shot when he has fought let's say, less than up-to-par competition? I would definitely like to see him have at least one fight in UFC before they give him that title shot, but I know he's been 
pushing for that title shot, and I could see them doing it. But, yeah, I would like to see him have one fight in UFC first. I mean, if it was up to me, I would take winner of Henderson Guida, whichever one that is. But I could see him going either way. Sounds sensible. So let's move on to the pay-per-view. The opener was the featherweight Hatsu Hiyoki from Japan, former Shuto champion, former Sengoku featherweight champion. He defeated George Roop by split decision. And with the Brendan Vera fight that aired at some point during the night, what was up with this fucking judging, Amira? I could not believe that they handed Hatsu Hiyoki this fight. Now, clearly, he won the second round because really what else is there to say about the story of that round? He, yes, took him down and he got the mount and did pretty much nothing. Outside of that, I think George Roop had it. Maybe the first round I could see a little... But I had it scored for George Roop. There was no doubt in my mind. And I could not believe that decision, and I don't think the live crowd either. So what do you think? Yeah, I definitely think that Roop won that. But I don't think either guy really looked spectacular in that fight. Like you said, Hioki had some good takedowns, and he had some good transitions on the ground, but wasn't really going for much in the way of submissions or ground and pound. Roop, though, obviously better on his feet, but he really wasn't putting together a lot of combinations or really getting great shots off. So I would have scored it for him, but I don't think either guy was truly impressive in that fight. It's funny because this featherweight division, they just gave Kenny Florian a title shot. I don't really see a lot of guys who maybe it's because of his Anderson Silva-esque reputation or at least hype, but I don't see a lot of guys on the horizon in the featherweight division that I think could beat Jose Aldo outside of maybe if they gave Mark Hominick a rematch and he got a great round like that fifth round in Toronto. What do you think about possible contenders for Jose Aldo? I think Chad Mendez actually might have the best shot at it. And from what I hear, he is getting the next title yeah. shot. In Brazil um, in Because he is a strong wrestler. And I think that's what we really haven't seen with Jose Aldo yet. We haven't seen someone who can get him down over and over again and can keep him there. And that's what we've seen from Chad Mendez in every fight that he's had. So that's actually, I think, the person they're setting up with it is the right guy. The next fight saw the first of two legends retire at 137. It's funny how so many people, like I said, Amira, had that sentiment. I saw it on Twitter. I saw it on message boards. I saw it a lot of places that GSP's not on it. I'm not ordering it. To me, it sounds more like they're not real MMA fans. I mean, I'm a big Crow Cop fan. He has not obviously looked spectacular in UFC pretty much since his second fight on. I saw him get knocked out live in person this year in Newark by Brendan Schaub. And BJ Penn was kind of like the Booker T of UFC, where it seems like he's at that stage where he's saying every fight might be his last. But this one, he actually came out and said it. And, of course, we saw Randy Couture retire this year. Matt Hughes is pretty much done. But to have BJ Penn and Crow Cop both go on the same show, and people weren't going to order it because GSP wasn't on it. Not to say anything about the fights themselves, but just for that alone, it was pretty emotional. And Roy Nelson is <laughs> showing up in a fat suit at the weigh-ins. I'm really surprised that they didn't tell him to take it off. But, of course, yeah, it was I all because who knows what's on underneath that. <laughs> but weighing in at 252, of course, that fat suit, and it was pretty obvious, was all building up to the moment where he gets in the prep point and takes it off. So we see, whoa, he lost a lot of weight. I know you're impressed with that, Will Brooks. But as it was, Roy Nelson went on to defeat Crow Cop in the third round by TKO. You could see after a great second round, I thought that both of them looked good in that one. In the third round, it seemed like as soon as he took down Crow Cop, he just covered up and his heart was just done with that fight. So your thoughts, Amira, on the performance of Roy Nelson and Crow Cop? Nelson, yeah, he looked good in this fight. Krokop also, that's probably the best performance that we've seen from him in a while, or whatever that's worth. Basically, like you said, yeah, Nelson looks good in this fight. Once he gets you in that crucifix, there's not a whole lot you can do. Once he gets that on, that's scary. Uh, he may have lost yeah, some weight, but that's fight, still a lot of weight bearing down on you. Yeah, yeah. He has one that knows how to use the weight that he has to work for him as opposed to against him. He definitely had lost weight in this, but always for a guy in his size, he's had really surprising cardio. Will Brooks, your thought on Roy Nelson getting the victory over Crow Cop and the legend's retirement? I'm surprised Roy Nelson didn't thank, like, Weight Watchers or somebody in his victory speech. <laughs> but, um, I wasn't too, too shocked that Roy Nelson won. I think Roy Nelson's the more well-rounded and better fighter at this point. He's very well-rounded. 
Yeah, for Cole Cup retiring, just like BJ, just like BJ Penn retiring, it doesn't surprise me. But I don't think they'll stick to it because they were in the heat of the moment. They just got their ass kicked. They just got beat up. Of course, they're gonna say, "Okay, fuck this. I don't want to do it anymore." Until like they stick to it, say six months, a year down the line, then I'll believe it. But right now, I'm not sure I believe either one's retired officially. Even at Crow Cop's age and mileage? Well, because he retired like in the heat of the moment. He just lost. If he sticks to it, then okay, fine, cool. I think he should retire. But when the heat of the moment, you think differently than you do when you have time to think, reflect. So we'll see. All right. Well, sticking in the heavyweight division, Czech Congo coming off that amazing comeback victory over Pat Barry, that awesome knockout, handed Matt Mitrio in his first loss. And... I'm a big Matt Mitrione fan, but he earned it. All we saw out of him was some nice footwork, but that's pretty much it. And the judging on this one was absolutely right. There was really no other way to score it, and Mitrione knew he lost. Your thoughts, Amira, on Mitrione's really underwhelming performance and Congo's victory? Yeah, this was a really underwhelming fight. Congo clearly won, but, yeah, Mitrione didn't do much of anything. I think people expected a knockout here, and didn't get anything close to that. So, yeah, not really an impressive fight. Congo definitely won. Didn't have to do a whole whole lot to get that. <laughs> Man, Mitch, you know, he's getting better, but he's not getting as good as he should be for a guy who's progressed, who's like, moving up the ranks as much as he was. Like, everybody was talking about how good Matt Young is, but he hasn't really gotten, like, as well-rounded as he should be for getting his name out there as much as he has. Chet Conner, yes, definitely won his fight. No argument here. Do you think that he was just hesitant? Like you were saying, this is his sixth fight. So you'd think six fights into UFC, maybe he was just uh, intimidated by Congo's performance last time. Do you think he just hesitated too much? Yes, because he was a little overwhelmed. He hasn't gotten as good as he should be for a guy who's getting as close as he is. And when that happens, you're going to get your ass kicked. Well, he didn't get his ass kicked, but he lost pretty easily. No urgency. No. There was some urgency, though, <laughs> with BJ Penn. What a story this fight told. The main event in the welterweight division, Nick Diaz returning to UFC. Of course, we know he was just the strike force welterweight champion. Gave that up to originally face George St. Pierre, yada, yada, yada. He ends up fighting BJ Penn. And, of course, all the pre-match hype is like, BJ's like, I want to get back in title contention I didn't really feel that. It didn't seem very heartfelt. But speaking of heart, BJ Penn showed a lot because Nick Diaz was just like the Terminator in there. It was just a nonstop assault pretty much. I think in the post-fight press conference, Dana White said that he didn't think that BJ Penn would answer the the bell, I guess, for the third round. I was kind of expecting that too. It seemed like we were going to get a GSP BJ Penn sort of finish where he wasn't going to be able to continue. But as soon as he sat down after the second round, even though it seemed kind of fruitless, he was like, no, 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 I'm staying in. He showed a lot of heart and uh, <laughs> showed a lot of swelling too on that left eye. Man, BJ Penn, has he ever looked that beat up? Nick Diaz just looked like a force, and I think it's so funny how Nick Diaz has no problem talking when he's in his I'm-a-thug-talking-shit mode when he's in a fight, but at a press conference, then he gets pretty quiet or one-word sort of answers. But before we get into the aftermath of the fight itself, obvious unanimous decision in Nick Diaz's favor. BJ Penn just really couldn't do much to him. Diaz had some damage on his face, but they kept talking about his cardio throughout the fight, and it was just a nonstop pace. It wasn't like we were talking about last time, Amira, with Leonard Garcia, where he keeps pushing forward, but clearly he's running low on gas. It's almost like Nick Diaz just has an infinite amount of gas. He used Game Genie to cheat. But uh, what do you think about Nick Diaz's return to UFC? Obviously, he looks good here. Also, BJ, much as I agree that he had heart, he didn't look like he had cardio. It seemed like he was gassing <laughs> out in the second round. And we've <laughs> well, seen that he, maybe he had heart, but it wasn't in great shape. <laughs> We've seen that before from BJ. You, you kind of never know which BJ is showing up, especially at the fights that aren't at lightweight. One thing I really noticed here, though, is that Diaz definitely relied on his striking, and the one point that he didn't look great was in that first round when BJ had him on the ground and was kind of able to control him for a while when you could keep him there. And what that kind of made me think is if that's the case, I think we're going to see him have a lot more trouble with GSP because mm -hmm. taking you down and controlling you is what he does all day long. And I don't think he's going to be drawn into the same striking battle that we saw here, which is definitely what happened to BJ is he got 
stuck in a striking battle that he wasn't going to win. That's interesting, but we'll get to GSP and Diaz in a moment. What are your thoughts on BJ Penn's legacy in UFC? I know Will Brooks is hesitant to agree that everyone's retired when they say they are because it it happens. People do have second thoughts here and there, and it was in the heat of the moment, of course. But, again, if this is, in fact, the end of BJ Penn's career – Your thoughts on his legacy and what he means to mixed martial arts? It's pretty obvious that he's cemented himself as one of the standouts so far of all time in UFC. But like I said, he has kind of had those off and on times where it almost seems like when he really is motivated and wants to go in there, he's incredible. And then other times, not so much. We see a version where he maybe seems like he hasn't trained as hard. But I think... Despite all that, he's fought in a lot of different weight classes, titles. I think that he's definitely cemented himself as one of the all-time greats. Will Brooks, once again, it seems like the Diaz brothers, who are obviously Caesar Gracie students, they seem to want to just box these guys. And, of course, we've all known the story of Nick Diaz saying that he entertained ideas of boxing at some point after MMA or during, if he could have gotten away with it in strike force. And it seems like they want to show off those skills, and this fight didn't really go to the ground very much, if at all. It seemed like he just punched Penn's face off. So your thoughts on Nick Diaz's performance and, like I asked Amira, BJ Penn's legacy in MMA, regardless of even if this is his actual retirement or not? A lot of people in mixed martial arts kind of shit on boxing because it's like the uh, kind of competition sport. But if you look at all like a lot of great fighters today, they all have a great background, a good basis in boxing. The more mm-hmm. crisp your boxing is, the better fighter you are. Nick Diaz has some of the better boxing going right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like you said, he just teed off on BJ's face the entire fight to the point where BJ Penn almost looked unrecognizable. Like one of the worst beatdowns I've ever seen in mixed martial arts. It's sad because BJ Penn is a legend. He's called the prodigy for a reason. That name wasn't just handed to him. He earned that title because he is that badass. Mm-hmm. And it is a little sad, but then again, that's when fighting, you got to understand your last fight, you should be the one where you get your shit kicked out. You're going to be like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Not everybody can have like that great John Elway, I won a Super Bowl, now I'm going to walk away now. Not everybody's going to have that. Sometimes you're going to have the Randy Couture, I just got knocked out by a kick in the face. <laughs> by a crane kick, no less, which is pretty embarrassing, but whatever. But this is making me look forward to the the GSP fight all the more because here's a guy who's actually going to, like I said, going to take the fight to GSP like we haven't seen before. And right. if BJ Penn does take him down and control the fight like he tries to do with everybody else, which is totally going to be his game plan, which I don't blame him, let's not forget Nick Diaz is a black belt and he's a Gracie student. So even if he takes him down, Diaz knows what he's doing. He's not an amateur down there. He knows what he's doing and GSP doesn't watch it. He will get submitted and we will have a new champion and he will be a douchebag. We'll go from a robotic Canadian to asshole Californian. So I don't know which is better, but all I know is I want to see the fight. You think GSP is robotic? Dude, listen to the way he talks. He sounds like a robotic John claude Van Damme. <laughs> okay. Uh, top shot, Zach. I, I will uh, kick you in your head, and then I will submit you because uh, I am that good. And I, I am a mixed martial artist. And uh, you, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a robot, man. I love him. Love watching him fight. But, man, the guy's a robot. But, hey, he makes him a better fighter, so be robotic, man. Be on um, fucking Johnny Five. I don't care. Do it. Well, supposedly Diaz has lit a fire under GSP's ass, as Dana White has said. And it's funny because last time I was talking about Charles Sonnen showing essentially too much personality, whereas Nick Diaz usually shows too little personality. So I think there's a fine line in the middle there. But there is heat there right now, and that's what I wanted to move on to next. Nick Diaz, GSP, because that has been booked for Super Bowl weekend. Carlos Condit, at least according to Dana White, his manager said something else, but it's pretty much the official story, was asked to step aside because GSP was like, I want to take on this guy. Nick Diaz, GSP is on, which is funny because now I'm seeing people saying that GSP is ducking Carlos Condit. It's like lose-lose for him. Well, if he fights Condit, now he's ducking Nick Diaz, and if he fights Diaz, he's ducking Condit, whatever. Either way, he's going to be defending the belt and he'll be defending it against Nick Diaz. We were talking about boxing before, and it's interesting here because, like I mentioned, as you reiterated, Will, they are proponents of Caesar Gracie jiu-jitsu, the Diaz brothers are, but yet we've seen them pretty much utilize boxing. Well, what was the story of GSP's fight with Josh Koscheck? Boxing. I'm training with Freddie Roach, and he pretty much stood with Koscheck the whole time, and these are two guys known for the wrestling, but... 
GSP showed great boxing. Now, as you were saying with pushing the pace, that's a point I've tried making before about Diaz, GSP, should they fight. Like you were saying, well, this is not going to be a guy who, quote, shows too much respect for GSP like I believe Jake Shields did in Toronto early this year. Shields, everyone's saying, oh, this fight gets to the ground, it's over, but it really didn't. And it seemed like Jake Shields was very hesitant to close the distance or shoot or really engage GSP. Nick Diaz ain't going to be doing that shit. (laughs) This is going to be a war, and I look forward to it. And after that fight with BJ Penn, and I think he's looked so good this year, Nick Diaz has that incredible fight with Paul Daly, great victory. And I don't see this guy falling so quickly to GSP. This looks like after we've had a few years now, of GSP as the champion, someone I don't see GSP dominating so easily. So I'm really looking forward to it. And one other moment before I turn it over to you guys is one thing that no one's pointed out is if this is Super Bowl weekend, this is supposed to be the first UFC shown in theaters in 3D. So we're going to get to see Diaz and GSP in 3D. So that's going to be awesome. And I look forward to that. So your thoughts, Amira, on Nick Diaz and GSP's showdown in February. I do think you're right that it is going to be someone that absolutely takes the fight to him, and we're going to see a very different version of GSP have to come out if he wants to win this. But I don't think this is going to be as easy for Nick Diaz as a lot of the fights that he had in Strike Force, and even so much this BJ Penn one, because like I said, I don't think GSP is just going to be drawn into this striking battle and not go for takedowns and just stand with him if that's not working out for him. GSP is good at changing his plan if he needs to, and I don't know that that's something that we've seen from anybody else that's fought Diaz recently. They've kind of stuck with what they were doing, even if it wasn't working. I don't think we're going to see as easy of a fight for Diaz as some of the ones that we've seen recently where he's looked great. But I am really excited to see how this goes and to see somebody who actually comes in there and, like you said, doesn't show that respect for GSP, isn't afraid of him. Gives him a run for his money. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's excited. And the 3D thing is crazy. I have no idea what that's going to be like, but <laughs> that should be interesting. It's going to be like Avatar, but fighting. <laughs> With the right build-up, if they do that whole 24-7 thing that they do on big fights, they have this built up properly. This fight could be fucking huge. Like, it's going to be complete contrast of styles and personalities. It will be a lot of fun just to watch the build-up, let alone the actual fight itself you got to give GSP a lot of credit. When he wants to learn something, he goes out and learns from the best. He trains in boxing from Freddie Roach, the same guy who trains Manny Pacquiao. He trains with Greg Jackson. Greg Jackson turns good athletes into great athletes. He doesn't turn them into great fighters. He just turns them into better athletes. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. But he still knows how to go out there and become the absolute best he could possibly be. And I love him for it. And I think he's going to beat Diaz, but it's not going to be as easily as everybody thinks it's going to be. Everybody thinks you're going to walk all over him. I don't believe that's going to happen. But you know what? I can't wait to find out. Yeah, and it's interesting because in the sense that Diaz has this BJJ background, well, we've got a wrestling specialist in GSP who, like you said, adapts to other situations. We saw him train in Henzo Gracie's school in New York for jiu-jitsu whenever he can. It's going to be a great fight. I don't even know how we can hype it up some more. Before we move on to pro wrestling, though, because we are going to mention Ring of Honor, Amira, you are a Ring of Honor fan, and I guess that's going back several years at this point. Just out of curiosity, what turned you on to Ring of Honor and what made you a fan? I saw WWF stuff when I was little, but when I was watching wrestling in high school, I kind of got into, like, ECW and stuff like that, so I sort of knew the indie world existed from having watched ECW, so I kind of knew that there was other stuff out there, and at some point just came across the Ring of Honor stuff online, and I was really into it. I always liked the smaller guys and the cruiserweight-type wrestling, and that was something that Ring of Honor had that you didn't find in WWE, at least not so much. So that was kind of where I got into it, was just a lot more of the style that I liked. All right, cool. Well, thank you for joining us once again for Mixed Martial Arts. We're going to move on to pro wrestling in a moment, but first up going to go to some callers. There are no polls and no news this week. I put up a huge news update once again, as I do weekly on the website. So if you want to find out about Maurice's release, the wrestler who is suing Abdullah the Butcher for hepatitis C, going for Olympic gold, international results, and all that sort of stuff. Everything you need to know is on the news update on WrestlingRoundTable.com. 
and the polls. I'm going to keep up for another week because I want some more votes from you people. Go to the polls at WrestlingRoundtable.com and cast your vote. The two polls are about how much you can stay in TNA after everything that happened, not just, I would say, at Bound for Glory with Robert Roode, but let's see what you think now after reading the spoilers of all the hot potatoing that the title does over the next couple shows. I think that'll fuel your vote. But also, what rivalries do you want to see WWE do their next Blu-ray on? The Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels' greatest rivalry came out last week. Can't find a damn copy anywhere. Looking forward to that. And we'll be covering Montreal on our season finale, coupled with the submission round five Q&A. We want to get your question in for that as soon as you can. So before we go on to some more pro wrestling, some calls first. David in South Carolina, what's going on? What's up, Eric? This is David, but you know me better as the one and only Armand Brown. What's up, Will? Dude, I'm sorry for calling you a preppy jerk loser. What's up to the oh-so-hot Corey? I loved Raw. I liked what I saw Raw with the Muppets last night, but the, other than that, the rest of the show was kind of a drag. Also, please, I will be posting a link to my wrestling fanfic on the Wrestling Roundtable page. I'm actually trying to do it right now as we speak. Please go check it out. It's, really, it's very real written, as Corey said it was. And plus, I need the publicity. I'm a bigger mark for my own voice as Jeff Jarrett is, so I need the publicity. Justin in Eagle, Wisconsin. Hello. This season of The Ultimate Fighter, you been catching it lately? Nope. And as big into mixed martial arts as I am, every time I try, I really can't get into the show. I really can't. I, I just don't like reality TV. Even when Brock was on it, I tried getting into that. And all I care about really is the training and the fighting. I can't believe that in a time now, of course... A lot of people have been saying that Spike was putting Ultimate Fighter on at pretty much late and bad hours and time slots to reduce the rating. So that way, when the deal runs out, they'd have more leverage. But, of course, that didn't work out, and they signed with Fox. And the Lesnar appearance on that season did not generate huge ratings, even though he's pretty much one of, if not the biggest draw in UFC pay-per-view buy rate-wise. I can't believe that with the ratings the way they are, and so many fans saying that the show needs an overhaul, that they're still hyping up every week of, look what happened in the house with someone pouring stuff on the bed. I just really don't give a fuck. When it comes to the training, we see a few clips, and I'm more interested in technique and how they actually do train for the fights than the few snippets that they show. I don't really care for the reality TV setup. Uh, Will Brooks, have you been watching it? I haven't watched this season. I heard this season's been actually really good. I haven't been watching it, no. The last season I watched all the way through was uh, Matt Hughes, Matt Serra. And then I remember <laughs> I tried, I really tried to watch the season with uh, Rashad Evans and Rampage Jackson, but the fights were all horrible. And then once you found out Rampage wasn't going to fight Rashad, I really lost all interest and didn't give a shit anymore because all that smack talk wasn't going to lead anywhere. So why the hell did I want to hear it? Well, that also kind of killed the Lesnar season, too, when uh, we found out that he got sick again and couldn't compete, and there goes that fight. Amira, have you been watching Ultimate Fighter? I have been watching it. I love this season. Because this season all is right. all bantamweights and featherweights, and those are my mm-hmm. favorite classes. Well, actually, and uh, how think... about you talk to Justin about it? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Justin. Hello, Amira. Yeah, one of the things I think is great about this season is I think for the past couple seasons, we haven't been seeing the best people and the best fights because it's kind of like at this point in most of the weight classes, a lot of the really great undiscovered fighters have kind of been discovered or in camps that are already, you know, getting into the UFC in ways that aren't ultimate fighter. But this season, we have two weight classes that weren't in UFC before. So we're really seeing guys that I think can actually be something because we're really seeing this whole new group of people that never had a shot before. We've really seen some good fights and some people that can actually do something in those weight classes. I think we'll see more than just the two winners in UFC eventually. I agree completely. I mean, I'm seeing not just guys with, like, 2-0 and experience or 5-1 and experiences, but, like, all sorts of guys with, like, a dozen fights, two dozen fights, sometimes three dozen fights under their belts. Just the, just the two-hour opening I was, like, worthy of a pay-per-view card in of itself. I was pissed. They Absolutely, didn't show... that show was that was awesome. I was actually especially pissed when they didn't show the the fight where I, where the no the the green haired guy what was his name like Leon Luis. or yeah, Luis. 
from the snippets they showed, it looked like he went through a three-round war, and I was pissed that they didn't show his fight. Oh, yeah, yeah there, was, there were a couple fights they only showed kind of like highlights of. Let me ask you this, Amira, and I guess you too, Will Brooks, because when you're talking about bringing in the Ultimate Fighter winners to UFC, is it just me, or has it been a while where an Ultimate Fighter competitor or winner has really risen to stardom. I, I, we just talked about Matt Mitrione before, but when we were talking about guys with experience, Roy Nelson came into Ultimate Fighter as a former IFL heavyweight champion. Kimbo Slice, even though he didn't have a lot of experience, was already a star and had main evented shows for other companies and whatever. But taking away the guys who are experienced, if you go back to, let's say, season one, you look at how many guys went on to be major UFC stars, it's like almost every one of them. And I just feel like we haven't seen that in a while. So what are your thoughts on the potential careers of Ultimate Fighter competitors, Will Brooks and Amira? Let's go to you first, Will. Oh, you have Rashad Evans. You have Diego Sanchez, Kenny Florian. There's been some good ones, but they were most of the early seasons, you know? Yeah. I got it. The last couple of seasons, yeah, I haven't seen too many, like, dominant guys. Like, Shop's pretty good, and Mitch Young's done pretty well up until his last fight. I don't think it's, like, a waste of time or something like that, but the winners really aren't, like, doing as well as they should be. But I wish they would go back to what they did. I think it was um, one of the earlier seasons. I think it was season four. It's called The Comeback, when they had a bunch of guys who were already in the UFC for a while, and then they said, if you win this, you get a title shot. I mm-hmm. wish they would kind of do that again. That was a good idea, and it worked for Matt Serra. He won the title. So why not do that again? That's a good idea. To revamp the whole show. Well, they are going to be starting on Fox, or FX, I should say, next year with a different format, and they will be going to Brazil. That's pretty much official. Dana White has also said that they plan on going to Canada and the Philippines in future seasons, too. So hopefully these, I don't want to say gimmicks, but maybe themes will lead to some more different and interesting seasons. But your thoughts, Amira, on pretty much the lack of Ultimate Fighters becoming real megastars like the Forrest Griffins and Stefan Bonners and Rashad Evans of the past. Um, I think it goes right along with what I said about in the more recent seasons, you're not getting top guys because a lot of those guys are already there. You're getting guys that have one and one record. They're too new. They aren't going to go from that to superstardom in the UFC. It doesn't work that way. And in the beginning, you were having guys come in that knew what they were doing, that just were looking for an opportunity to actually get there. And that's why I think this season's a bit different because we have guys that are coming in with real records that know what they're doing and just haven't had that shot. So, yeah, right. I think Definitely. There hasn't the kind of stardom in the most recent seasons that we saw earlier. All right. Well, like I said, hopefully that's rectified soon with the new Fox deal. But we're moving on to pro wrestling right now. And, Corey, you are up first because as our indie aficionado, you just attended, I believe, this weekend, AAW. And that's going to be airing on GoFi Live, so tell us some more about that. This was a great show. This is a great early birthday present to myself since my birthday's on Thursday. Happy I... early birthday. Why, thank you. Now, what does AAW stand for, and where are they located? Oh, shoot, I actually forgot <laughs> what it stands for, because at the shows, they always just say AAW. All albino wrestling? <laughs> no. They call themselves <laughs> Pro Wrestling Redefined. Everyone have... says that. <laughs> They have a little bit of everything. They've had some matches that are more high-flying, some matches that are technical, some matches that are very hardcore. So there's a match for everybody on this card. We had nine matches, a lot of wrestlers, from Ring of Honor, Michael Elgin and Truth Martini and Jimmy Jacobs. Rhino was in a match. Just this incredible card. The Clash versus Samurai Del Sol, Dan Lawrence, and Zero Gravity. We had Mina Libra versus Mischief, which was a really fun match. We had Gregory Iron and Christian Faith versus the Awesome Threesome. Mason Beck. Gregory Iron? Yeah, Gregory Iron. He's a mainstay at AAW. He was at the meet and greet as well, as well as M Dog, Greg Valentine, Honky Tonk Man, Big Papa Pump, and ODB, and Rhino. They all did a meet and greet before the show. Tag titles match between the House of Truth and the Irish Airborne. M Dog 20 versus Shane Hollister. Jimmy Jacobs versus Eric Cannon and a excellent dog collar match and our main event was silas young versus rhino in a really great match just awesome match i can't say enough about this so this is worth a purchase you're saying absolutely i think the pay-per-view is only going to be fifteen dollars 
And it's an awful lot better than you would imagine. This doesn't actually feel like an indie show when you watch it. The production value is quite good. They've got really great lights, a big, big set. So when you watch it, it feels more like what you would expect on television, but this is actual wrestling and not 30 minutes of somebody talking. We had just a whole bunch of people come out for this show. The crowd was pretty packed, and... The wrestling itself was really good. Like I said, there's something for everybody here. Ring of Honor is another independent, well, it's not independent anymore, (laughs) but it's on that level. Promotion that you follow, and I believe you wanted to talk about their latest show that is on their website right now. Yeah, I'm still a week behind since Ring of Honor is not in my market. Not their latest show that's on the website right now. (laughs) No, I got the general mission account on the website, so I saw what I believe was last week's show, which had T.J. Perkins going up against Mike Mondo, and that was a really cool match. T.J. Perkins, he did this really cool move. It was like, I'm not even sure how I can describe it because I forgot the name of it. Partial surfboard, but not quite. It was really cool, and I encourage people to go to the website, get the general mission account just to watch this. I noticed, too, that the more recent television shows have been improving. I noticed that there's better lighting, and on the website, there's no more glitching out during some of the matches. Lots of talking, too. Yeah, I noted that there was only two matches on this show, and then a lot of promos. I understand that they want to get new fans acclimated to the product, but it would be nice if they scaled back some of the talking and video package segments. I'm noticing that the video editing is getting better, too. You can see that at ROHWrestling.com, but we're going to stick with pro wrestling but move on to the big leagues, so to speak, because WWE's latest in their never-ending series of pay-per-views aired on Sunday, October 23rd from San Antonio, Texas. That would be Vengeance 2011, and a motto in San Antonio, Texas, they came to your hometown, and we're glad to have your report from that. So before we get into what aired, would you want to tell us about the dark match? The dark match was actually really good. It would have been nice if it actually ended up on the actual card because Daniel Bryan came out and he was as over as he can be right now, even though they haven't really been utilizing him. He did the whole briefcase thing and Wade Barrett, and they had a really good technically sound match and, and I was just uh, very surprised that they put some horrible Eva's title match on there and they, they couldn't really give that match over um, but Barrett beat Brian and was still generating some good, um, some good heat, some good heel heat. Even though I, I mean, I don't, I haven't been watching SmackDown, so I haven't really been paying attention to this. Okay, well, the pay per view itself opened with the tag title match between Cloudy Air Boom, I guess we can call them now, <laughs> beating U.S. Champion of Dolph Ziggler and Jack Swagger, Vicky's crew. Of course, I'm making a joke about what we found out today, that Evan Bourne was suspended, likely for synthetic weed, much to, I don't think, anybody's real surprise. That's a situation yet to be rectified. Um, We'll see how they handle that. Could be just as easy as someone attacks him, quote-unquote, backstage before a title defense, and Kofi has to go out by himself and lose the belt to Awesome Truth or something on Raw or whatever. But we'll see. As it was, their latest tag team title defense on pay-per-view, successful. How was it live, Amato? Really good. Um, A lot of the spots that they did um, were really great. Air Boom was just really good over. And, of course, you know, Vicky Guerrero getting all that great heel heat. Um, the match itself was, was really good. This would have been the second match, I think, that they had. This was back-to-back title matches. I actually thought Ziggler and Swagger were going to go over. Great great tag team wrestling, like, all around. Um, I especially liked the end when Kofi was actually going for the, the SOS and, and Dolph blocked him. Kofi kicked uh, Dolph and Swagger in the head and gets him with the big um, crossbody and goes for a boom drop. Bourne takes up Swagger, and she hits him with the Trouble in Paradise after the, the SOS, if I'm not mistaken. Bourne hits her boom, which everybody just went popped over. It takes him forever to hit it, actually. Great match. Great work, and uh, a lot of the whole crowd was just really over for air boom. That segued into Dolph Ziggler pulling double duty, defending the U.S. title immediately afterwards against Zack Ryder, who has gotten very over in at least the mid-card whenever he's allowed on TV. I'm sure a lot of people expected Ryder to take the belt here. 
a lot of people were very disappointed that he did not win, but he actually has a big following because there's a bunch of bursts and headbands out there, and as soon as his music hit, the whole crowd was just going out, uh, going over for him, like if Cena himself had came out or something. But um, the match was pretty good. He had as much offense as he could. I haven't really been, you know, seeing him have some long matches on Raw, so I, I really haven't been trying to keep up with his offense as much as you would see, like, a Brock or, or a Sean or somebody. But the match was pretty good, and the distraction, I actually thought he wasn't going to lose from a super kick. I thought the match was going to go a lot longer. But um, Ziggler was looking really good in both of his matches, and I guess I guess you can say he's kind of coming into his own uh, as his, his character now compared to when he was junior. A lot of people were really, really mad, but overall, Ryder um, was making Ziggler work a lot. He looked really tired, but, you know, double duty, just like the um, 04 Bad Blood with he who we do not speak of pulling double duty as well. But overall, the match was good, and everybody was over for Ryder and very disappointed when he did not win the United States Championship. The last pay-per-view, which you would think would mean about a month ago, but now it means a matter of weeks, Corey, saw Beth Phoenix take the title, the Divas Championship, and she defended it successfully against Eve Torres. Your thoughts on Beth's title defense? Well, I'm glad that the right woman won. I'm a very big Beth Phoenix fan. I'm sorry to say this, but I really don't understand what people see in Eve Torres. She knows two or three wrestling moves. I see she's tried to improve, but no, this match, she did not shine to me. I'm very glad that Beth Phoenix won. She deserves to have won that match. Sheamus once again defeats Christian on pay-per-view. How was it live, Amato? Christian didn't get as much uh, heel heat as I thought he was going to. Sheamus was very over, as much as he could be. The match was really well booked. They told that story of Christian getting in Sheamus' way. A lot of the crowd, when Christian was uh, slapping Sheamus across the face, like every chance he had got, uh, the crowd just getting into the fact that he wasn't giving him a close fist across the face. He was slapping him across the face. You can tell that his face was getting really red, Christian was working really good, as much as he usually does. He's a great worker, in my opinion. I've always been a good fan of Christian. He was uh, really good for not having as big as a storyline as Christian's had over the course of the year. Really, really good work match, and um, the crowd was really over for Sheamus. King Devitt in our chat room just said, wrestling isn't big in Texas. If this was 1984, we wouldn't be saying that. Tom in Levittown, Pennsylvania, you're on the line didn't have an opportunity to call during the MMA segment, so I just want to talk about um, Viacom Paramount buying uh, Bellator. I think it's a great move on both parties because um, Bellator is an MMA promotion. MMA is really hot uh, right now. Bellator would benefit with uh, Paramount's money. Paramount makes a lot of money off of CBS and stuff, and um, Bellator could use some of that. Bellator could be more popular since it's on Spike, and um, it fills a void well, for... not uh, right now. Oh, Yeah. True, but in 2013, right? That's a long ways away in TV. Yes, it, <laughs> it, it fills um, a void for them in the future that w- they will lose from UFC. All right, well, let's get back to vengeance. Awesome Truth defeated Triple H and CM Punk. A lot of people saying, oh, great, Triple H and Nash and all this other booking stuff has killed CM Punk's run. And even though I guess they're segueing now into Punk and... Alberto Del Rio and Triple H's quote off TV selling Kevin Nash's attack, I guess. A lot of people saying the anti-authority punk, why the hell should he be teaming with Triple H now? Just another tag team. It's just people are really disappointed with it. But Awesome Truth, they're at least busy. They gave those two something to do. That's not a title contention sort of thing. They could get lost in the shuffle. They're kept in an important angle, at least, and people really like how they're doing together as a team. But Kevin Nash, now, people are still saying, well, when he gets medically cleared, he's going to return to the ring. I don't know. I mean, I think that whole thing where the punk match with Kevin Nash that was aborted was really more to do with him doing the movie than any sort of medical issue. He has still been wrestling on indies because he is a WWE legend and has a legend contract. (laughs) But, uh... Maybe WWE just does more strict drug testing for liver enzymes than fucking Juggalo Championship Wrestling does. <laughs> but uh, Kevin Nash came back after a, another short hiatus. He seems to pop in and out whenever it's convenient. 
and interfered in this match, too. So how was it live, Amato? Awesome Truth was just getting hated on. I was actually um, enjoying their rap because I, I like the remix. They're, they haven't even gotten the ring yet, and they just draw so much heat from the crowd. Um, CM Punk and Triple H obviously very over. As soon as their music hits, the kids and the adults go really crazy. Um, but the match itself was actually pretty. I, I stayed really entertained. Uh, I did like the whole um, Miz in the figure four with Punk pulling the, the arms of Triple H. It's kind of old school Flair and Triple H style type thing. But uh, the match was, was really good. Um, even at the at the end when it just started getting real chaotic, it was really funny because I didn't, you know, hadn't read into, you know, the actual storyline. And I actually saw Kevin Nash walking, uh, you know, at the bottom. He actually kind of passed by a row at the bottom, and I was like, oh, you know, hey, there's Nash, you know, I wonder what he's going to what he's gonna do, and so, you know, he nails Triple H, and Truth uh, comes out, and, you know, Miz goes for the Gold Clutch finale, covers, you know, Punk, and then you have the brawl afterwards, where, you know, Nash is in the ring, and hitting Triple H, then he gives him that jackknife powerbomb, and that powerbomb looked really bad. Triple H landed, it looked like he landed on his shoulder or his left elbow really bad, and uh, the replays didn't, they, they just convinced it. It looked really bad. He had to get helped out. I mean, I don't know if that was on TV or they were showing him get uh, walked out. Um, I believe it, it was like replayed on to... Raw the next night, if nothing else, but uh, I, I don't think it was as bad as people made it out to be. I mean, he took the bump a little high up on his neck, but he tucked his chin fine, and I, I don't think it was as bad as people were reacting. Now, that's not to say it wasn't convincing if they're going to do a storyline injury off of it, as they did. It worked for that, but I think he was okay. But as you were saying. Yeah, uh, a lot of people in the crowd were they were questioning if he was going to be able to be okay. Um, I had found out while I was in the crowd that you know um, Nash was going to come back and they were going to ha- they were going to attempt to have some sort of gimmick match on on at Survivor Series, which uh, you know that's what the the buzz was there. So I mean, if he had gotten hurt, they would they would probably you know nix that match. But I mean, uh, I guess WWE might see if it might have just been a stinger for Triple H and. I'll probably just throw that match in the Survivor Series anyway. I couldn't actually see parts of the match because they had this one camera guy who decided to ride Punk's ass. I'm not sure if you could see that live, but this guy got up onto the lip of the ring and was on top of Punk. So for parts of the match, all I saw was camera over Punk's shoulder, and I felt that that was very distracting. The bit with Kevin Nash coming in through the crowd and punching out Triple H That was an interesting moment, and I know that it's going to lead to something much bigger between the two again, but at the same time, I just couldn't help but think that this felt more like a lover's quarrel than a true match. I mean, the way Triple H looks up at him, he doesn't look up at Kevin Nash like, oh, I'm going to kick your ass for punching me in the face. That's not what happened. What I noticed was Triple H looked up like, Daddy? Why did you do it? And it just destroyed the whole moment right there. The way that these two interact is not the way wrestlers should interact with each other, and I'd like it to stop. Didn't help the next night on Raw when Triple H, and they put this in the video package, I don't know why. Triple H said, Kevin Nash, you didn't just punch me in the face. You broke my heart. If that does not kill the next pay-per-view, I don't know what will. Because that whole moment was just killed right there. Well, Brooks, how do you think this whole Triple H, Punk, Nash, John Laurinaitis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, angle has progressed? Boring. I don't care about Triple H. I don't care about Triple H's friends. I don't care about any stupid squabbles or any of that shit. I don't want to see a 50-year-old guy fight a 40-year-old guy. I don't care about Laurinaitis. I never did. Punk was cool until he got involved in all this crap that makes no sense and has nothing to do with anything. Uh, you know, it's just so frustrating. You want to like the product. You really do. But they make it so hard to do so. <laughs> you know, like that's, you, actually, you, that's actually a point I'm going to make later when we get to Raw, but continue yours. <laughs> we said the same thing when we left TNA Bound for Glory. We said, we want to like you, TNA. Why won't you let us like you? <laughs> you know, it's like, why do they do this to you? That makes no sense. CM Punk was awesome, and then they brought Triple H in for no reason. The only way it would work is if Triple H would make C 
see a punk. It's just like we'll put him over. That's the only way it would make sense to me. Like, okay, cool. You want him to take a guy who's really who's a star and help make the next guy a bigger star by losing to him. That's I can understand that. I get it. But they have not done that. They've done the exact opposite. They made Triple H go over on CM Punk, which makes no sense. Because and now Marvel, they're like going off in different directions. Exactly. It's like, where the fuck are you taking me? <laughs> I'm glad I don't invest in WWE. I just like two hours every Monday night. That's all I do. <laughs> I'm glad I don't buy the interviews. And, you know, I'm glad I don't. Well, besides the Zach Ryder t-shirt and, and headband I got, I'm glad I don't invest in the company at all. Yeah, it's just like you. Ugh. Aside from the two hours every week and the merchandise you buy. <laughs> hey, I just bought a t-shirt and the headband. That was only for Halloween. Okay, that was it. <laughs> Well, believe me, I'm continuing your sentiment over into the next match because everyone made a big deal that Cody Rhodes brought back the Intercontinental belt design from back in the 80s and 90s that everybody liked. And then what did they do? They job him to Randy Orton on pay-per-view. Didn't Randy Orton beat Cody Rhodes and Dolph Ziggler like pretty much back-to-back? Like, what the fuck are they doing? Seriously. Uh, you know, I'll go into detail about that more when we get to Raw. I'm trying to calm down. <laughs> I can tell you one thing, Eric. Dolph Ziggler did two matches in a row and won both matches. That was pissed off. Zach Ryan didn't go over Dolph Ziggler, who just had his second match in a row. I look at the exact opposite. I looked at it as they're trying to build Dolph Ziggler as the next big heel, but they're doing it slowly. Which I'm all for, because I think Dolph Ziggler's talented, and I think he can play that role very well. But having him lose to Randy Orton, yes, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But at the same time, though, I'm looking at Dolph Ziggler as the next big villain in wrestling, at least in WWE. Losing to the big face right now in SmackDown doesn't bother me, but I would have liked to see him the other way around, or some kind of shitty finish, or something along those lines, instead of just losing to him. But eh, that's just me. It's not so much about Ziggler being hurt or anything like that, as much as it is about the belt. Because they bring back the Intercontinental Belt design, but yet the next pay-per-view, the champion's losing to Randy Orton, who it's kind of like when Triple H, at various points in years past, was above the Intercontinental title. They just pretty much, I think they even verbalized it, where Randy Orton's like, he's not going to waste his time with these belts. Well, <laughs> you can't treat your belts like that. I'm sorry. It's just This is why belts, in so large a degree don't mean as much anymore but before we get to the match itself i'm surprised joining our panel jay oletto hey jay i'm back and better than ever buddy you're alive yeah how's your shoulder it it actually sucks right now i'm not gonna lie it really sucks (laughs) what happened did kevin nash power bomb you (laughs) He, he did, man. He, he broke. He broke into my house and power bombed me to my coffee table. It sucked. Did little, he break your heart? Injury. He did. He did. I was so upset. I just wanted to chime in real quick on this uh, Randy Orton, Cody Rhodes topic because I did owe you guys. I feel the same exact way. If you're gonna put Cody Rhodes in a non-title match against Randy Orton on a pay-per-view and just have him straight up job, and since it was a non-title, there was no way that I thought that Cody Rhodes was gonna win that match. No right. way whatsoever. And if you put that belt on the line. And, you know, Randy Orton actually cares about becoming Intercontinental Champion. Just for, like, just for a second. You, you just throw it in there for a second. And the fans think that he wants to be Intercontinental Champion. You raise the prestige of your title like that. Mm-hmm. You give Cody Rhodes the win, put him over for once. Well, even if they were going to do Randy Orton still winning because he's a main eventer and he has to, I guess, couldn't it just have been, like, a count-out or disqualification or some sort of fuck job thing so at least we don't have to make it tell – like Will Brooks was saying, telegraph the finish – before it even happened? Exactly. They've been doing that for way too long with uh, Randy Orton. Even John Cena, when he was out of the title picture for a minute, it was the same exact concept with him. They bounce around with these mid-card guys, the Dolph Ziggler's and the Cody Rhodes guys and stuff like that. It doesn't seem to elevate this talent at all. They're just staying in the mid-card. They're not getting in the main event. And that's the way it looks like it's going to stay until at least after, after WrestleMania the next year. A motto, legacy explodes. Orton, obviously, over. Uh, kids... And girls, pretty much. It was pretty decent. Rhodes, it was like how y'all had said in um, shows before when y'all were talking about DiBiase and and Rhodes and everyone thought, uh, you know, Rhodes wasn't going to do anything because Vince wasn't high on him and everyone liked DiBiase because they gave him that movie and they pushed him and stuff. But I remember when in 07 when Rhodes and Orton were having those uh, battles, you know, when when Rhodes was green. Cody's came a uh, you know a long way because you know he was you know getting um, a little bit more into his character and you know he was battling with Orton as much as he can. He should have won this match. 
as soon as he had crossroads, I was like, oh, you know, this is it. Go, you know, they're going to put him over. And even if they have another match and Rhodes wins again, which they should do, this is watching Cody Rhodes' character and, you know, Randy Orton should start dropping at these mid-carters so they can get pushed just like Jay said. And then, you know, everything goes to hell because he drops the DDT and he hits the RKO and it's over. And I was just like, oh, look, they just fucking clusterfucked this whole match and ruined this character. A lot of the people were complaining that in the build-up to the World Heavyweight title match with Mark Henry and Big Show about Big Show knocking out Mark Henry with his one-punch knockout, what do they call it, the weapon of mass destruction or whatever, as great as they've made Mark Henry look in the past couple months. I mean, I've always been a proponent of using someone's push as a storyline excuse for someone getting time off. I don't think Big Show and Kane necessarily had any sort of injuries that they needed immediate surgery for, like a bad shoulder like Jay has, or a bad knee or something. It's not like they needed surgery or something immediately, but give these guys some time off the road. I'm sure they got a lot of bumps and bruises that they need to rehab, and it's good to give guys some time off, and what better way than to use that as a way to build up Mark Henry. They did it with Great Kali is another way to send Kali off. So Mark Henry takes out all these monsters. I think it's a great idea, but people complaining about Big Show knocking out Mark Henry, look, Mark Henry may be a former Olympian and strong man, but when you've got a seven foot giant punching you in the face, how can anyone complain about that knocking somebody out? Sorry, I just don't buy that. Especially because it's not like Henry jobbed the belt. Of course, they redid the suplex off the second rope I would call it a superplex, but superplex is off the top. Sorry. Technicality. But Mark Henry suplexing Big Show off the second rope, breaking the ring, which has never, ever, ever, ever been done in WWE before, I think. Except, of course, according to the DVD they just put out, OMG Moments. Like was retweeted on our Twitter by a fan that I thought was making a funny point. He said, I hope they do Triple H and Undertaker again at WrestleMania this year coming up, and they pretend it was the first time again. (laughs) Because they just get really silly with what they acknowledge in their own quote-unquote universe. But I think it's WWE Multiverse, as I explained last month. But anyway, Mark Henry and Big Show broke the ring and in a no contest. And before we get to the fallout of that, Amato, I'm sure, got a great reaction live. It was huge, especially with the uh, younger the younger audience who probably weren't around to see the first collapsing of the ring. I did notice that it did look like the same ring post and the uh, same parts of the ring collapsed just like they did the first time. And uh, I actually had heard a kid say, oh, no, his horn frog under there, which <laughs> was really funny. <laughs> but the crowd really went ape shit. If only... And, um, <laughs> the the crowd really really uh, ignited for that, and they got the whole holy shit chant. Quick way to end the match. It was good for the, for their size, um, but a lot of people were kind of like waiting for something big to happen, and it did. Unstable comment in our chat room talking about what we were just mentioning with Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes said bringing back the old IC title style doesn't bring back the prestige it held back in the day. Sorry. Well, that's absolutely true, and it's all got to do with the booking. But back to Big Show and Mark Henry. Will Brooks, your thoughts on them bringing back the suplex ring explosion spot? Pretty appropriate, wouldn't you say? The only time I've ever seen a contraption like that collapse like that, and I actually enjoyed it, was when me and my girlfriend were in it. Um, <laughs> next joke, if anybody got that, I'm sorry, I was a little dry. Yeah. But, um... I liked it the first time because they ended the show with it. And they had this big suplex of Grin collapse. It was like a holy shit. And then they cut away from it. You don't have another fucking match after the fact in a broken ring. Didn't they learn anything from Hard Foundation Rockers? It doesn't work. <laughs> well, that was an accident. You know, so my point is, uh, how do you just have a match in a broken ring and think it's a good idea? Who, who the hell thought, like, in the reading room, hey, let's have Cena and El Mundo Rio match people are barely caring about it as it is. Let's have them care about it even less. And let's have a fucking broken ring. And make it awesome. It's not going to be fucking awesome. It's going to be fucking annoying and stupid and doesn't make any sense. Well, well, there was that Royal Rumble a few years ago where the 
title match of Kurt Angle and Mark Henry went last after the Rumble, and we were like, really? This after the Rumble? And then Undertaker made the ring collapse or some shit at the end of the pay-per-view, and we were like, oh, okay, now we understand why they put that last. Imagine if they had done that first, and then the Royal Rumble happened in a broken ring. Corey, your thoughts on Big Show Mark Henry? No contest. I guess it's not over between those two. I'm going to have to agree with what he said. That was completely irresponsible. If they were going to break the ring and recreate what Big Show did with Rock Lesnar. They should have had this close out the pay-per-view. It just did not look that great. I noted that there were some spots during the match where you could see the ring teetering, so you pretty much knew, oh, great, they're going to break the ring. We just didn't know at what point. I did not like the visuals where they had to stop everything, bring the truck out for Big Show, cart them off. The two were crying, and Big Show was swearing and saying all the words you can't say on television. I'm not sure if you heard that live, but I caught it loud and clear on TV. This should have closed out the show. When they segued into Alberto Del Rio and Cena, I couldn't help but notice that we start the match by having the ref and Ricardo and Alberto and Cena all looking at each other like, this is bullshit. I can't believe this is happening. I don't want to do this match. The fact that they had to take the main event backstage because it was safer screams that there's something wrong here. This was completely irresponsible. The ring looked stupid. The match looked stupid. And as for Mark Henry and Big Show, parts of the match were okay. Parts of it, they really tried their best. But this was after several minutes of the two of them being slow. I don't know who booked this, but he needs to be shot preferably with a taser in the balls. That just should not have happened. Sounds like you care about it way too much for people to have to suffer physical torture for booking a wrestling match. But anyway, before we get to the main event, Jay, your thoughts on the Mark Henry push, the match with Big Show, perhaps the ring collapsing, but a lot of people seem to be of the opinion, and you know how it is nowadays. Once the Internet makes up its own mind, that's what's going to happen, and the rumors start because it's based on nothing other than their own fantasy booking, as we saw just a couple months ago. There's going to be a Team ROH versus Team Triple H at fucking Survivor Series. Yeah, okay. Now it's Mark Henry's being built up to challenge Undertaker at WrestleMania. What do you think about that and everything we just mentioned? Well, this is the first time I'm hearing the rumor about Mark Henry wrestling Undertaker again at WrestleMania. I really don't like that idea. I think that's a very, very bad idea because Undertaker needs somebody to help carry him to a good match, a watchable match. And I don't think Mark Henry's a guy, as we saw at WrestleMania 22. Well, I don't However, think they're going to do that, but I'm just saying that seems to be out there, and they've made up their own mind, as the Internet yeah. does nowadays. I can see why they think that. But um, overall, I love Mark Henry's push. I think they're doing a really good job with it, finally giving him a run with the title. And you actually buy him as an unbeatable monster at this point because of these guys he's gone over. He's beaten Orton a bunch of times, and you know Orton beats everybody, so he's been able to beat Orton. And, <laughs> Especially uh, if you have a belt and you're a mid card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, you know what? I like this thing with the Big Show. I didn't mind the match with Avery. I thought it was pretty good for those two. They did a good job in beating the hell out of each other and kicking out in near falls. And the thing with the ring collapsing, it still shocked me. I didn't know it was going to happen. You could tell that the ring collapsed in a way where they knew Cena and Del Rio were going to have that match in the ring. I'm pretty sure it was safe. They had to have taken out precautions to make that ring somewhat safe so you didn't get Del Rio or Cena hurt by the ring collapsing anymore. They had to have. It was different. It gave Cena and Del Rio in the last man standing match different props to work with. They could have probably done more, but I thought there were some spots in that match that were really cool with the circumstances that were involved. You're building up towards another Mark Henry Big Show match, which is going to have a devastating conclusion no matter who wins. I'm sure Mark Henry's going to, but um, it'll definitely do just that much more to put Mark Henry over in the long run. You said it was different for anyone who might be saying something, maybe in the chat room or maybe on YouTube after the fact, that, well, it can't be different because they did it with Brock and Big Show. Well, that was 2003, so it's been, I think, long enough of a time. This isn't something they do every week, so it's not overdone. I think it's been a long enough time and with the right enough people that it was all right to do. But Corey said it didn't make for a good main event with Cena and Alberto Del Rio. Let's hear from you, Amato, your thoughts on the main event and how the crowd took to it in the arena live. The crowd, uh, after what happened with the ring, they were still waiting to see Cena. And you, Cena is always is over. I mean, as as he can be, but every time he comes to San Antonio, these kids and these girls just go ape shit over him because it's the majority of the crowd anyway. The match itself, I I didn't really like at all. They really couldn't. 
do anything. They really couldn't go anywhere. It was throwing punches and being on the floor. There was this spot that looked actually, from my vantage point, looked really bad, where Cena just, you know, tosses Del Rio, and he fly, he flew out of the... He, he just tossed him over, and he landed in the barricade, and it looked like he, you know, kind of landed pretty pretty bad. And when I saw the replay, I, um, or the second it took me to look back up and I saw it, um, it, it looked like he landed on the shoulder. I mean, obviously, he probably wouldn't have been anything. But when they got to the back and they were doing um, those spots where he... Uh, Del Rio was uh, pushing over the uh, the backstage equipment, and I noticed that when he was pushing over those towers on top of Cena, that he was grunting and trying to push him over because there's there's fucking sandbags on him. Just move the sandbags and push him over. They made it seem like it was heavy for Del Rio to push uh, push him over, but not heavy enough for Cena to uh, you know get out under it in about eight seconds to stand back up or that horrible spot where they threw him in that V um, and he was, you know, sitting inside of it. And I did like the run in and they're given that, I guess they just gave him that, uh, you know, awesome troop doesn't really, you know, care. They're just going to beat up on anybody anyways. The match was already, you know, fucked anyway. So, you know, hey, let's just throw these guys in there and end it already because it looks bad and we'll keep the title on Del Rio because we're going to build Cena and Rock next month. Well, how was it as an overall show? It seems like you've gone to several shows in San Antonio when they come around. I'd probably say it was a B, just because the the first part of the show was really great with the whole Ziggler and even the horrible Divas match was the way it was. And, and I want to note that, is it just me or have you all noticed over the years that they always make uh, the Divas learn that back foot cartwheel elbow move? I mean, every <laughs> diva has to know that move. Like, the cat knew it, and well, I'm pretty sure Jacqueline and Nydia and all those other fucking divas knew that. And everybody knows that move, even Kelly Kelly and, and uh, Eve. I guess uh, because it sh- looks athletic enough without being too athletic to actually do. Uh, yeah. The, the the card was, you know, relatively decent. The last two, I mean, it was it was good, you know, minus the Divas match. You can I mean, throw in the dark match, but minus the Divas match and the two main events, it was overall a, a decent show. I wasn't, didn't really care for the last two matches. It could have been way better and obviously better booked, and I don't know what the hell WWE is, you know, doing. It's like if they're going to go into SummerSlam and they don't want to give you a good show, because they want you to buy SummerSlam as they would want you to buy Survivor Series because of the rock and stuff. So I didn't think it was going to be, actually didn't think it was going to be as good of a show as it ended up being just because I knew Survivor Series was you know, a couple weeks away. I think a lot of people were overlooking the show. It seemed as if WWE was even doing it themselves. But after the pay-per-view itself, I think people were pretty satisfied with it overall. I mean, maybe not the greatest show like Money in the Bank was this year or anything like that, but... I think it didn't completely fail, but let's just see if that's reflected in the buy rate because that's probably not going to do too well. But thanks, Amato, for joining us on the panel tonight and giving us our live recap from Vengeance. But we're going to move on to Monday Night Raw, or I'm sorry, Raw Super Show. As it happened last night, the Halloween edition, everyone was talking about the Muppets. It didn't exactly reflect that in the rating. It's funny because you mentioned, Amato, that the first part of the show was better, I guess, than the second half. And it seems like that's what the audience feels about Raw the past several weeks. If you look at the ratings, they start off where people tune into the show and people tune out. It seems like they're losing a chunk of the audience because they don't seem to care about what happens. They tune in because they want to. They want to find out what happens next. We want to watch it. But then when they find out what's going on, they're like, ah, fuck it, I'll watch football. As it was, people were very excited about the Muppets. Now, I'm a huge Muppets fan. I'm a very big admirer of Jim Henson. In fact, I was talking to Carol Spinney this weekend, who does Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch at a horror convention. But the Muppets showed up on Raw. And I'm not even going to go into the area of it's not realistic because we all know the Muppets are puppets with people with their hands up there on off camera and whatever. How are they walking around backstage and the wrestlers are interacting with them like they're real? I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt this time, just for the sake of argument, because I really don't feel like going into that area. I mean, watching 
a lot of the stuff with Beaker and Sheamus and Miss Piggy and Kermit and Hornswoggle and Cody Rhodes backstage and everything, that sort of stuff. It felt more like I was watching a Muppets special than I was watching Raw. So in that sense, it is kind of silly to think that I was watching wrestling last night or sports entertainment. But the Cody Rhodes thing with the bag and Kermit really cracked me up. And Beaker was good with Sheamus, too, and uh, Grover with uh, Ziggler and Swagger. I'm Grover. What am I saying? Gonzo with Swagger and uh, Ziggler and whatever. But that being said, the rest of the show, holy fucking shit. Man, I I got a lot to say about that. But before we get into what else happened on the show besides the Muppets, let's hear your thoughts on the Muppets themselves, Will Brooks. I wish I kind of wish um, they would have called the show Raw is Muppets. Would have been very funny. I like the Muppets too, so to me, I took it all in good spirits. My favorite Muppet of all time is Beaker. So to see <laughs> Beaker and Jameis was kind of funny to me. But also seeing uh, Beaker run to the aid of Santino was kind of funny too. The only thing I would have liked to see better than what Santino did was spit in a um, dude's face. I would have liked to see Santino turn into like Super Cena and, and just like body slam the crap out of the guy. <laughs> and like out of swagger and just like, you know, start kicking his ass. I would have really loved to see him in that. That would have been great for me. But um, somebody on that Facebook page asked, who would you want to fight, Miss Piggy or Kelly Kelly? And I said, it depends on who's booking. If Ru- yeah. If Russo was booking, Miss Piggy would be the Divas champion by now. <laughs> I'd rather see that. She's probably a better worker than most of their roster. Yeah, she's Corey? got that chop. She knows that chop, man. You, every, 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 every moment I've ever seen in my life, she's, she's chopped somebody. So she's got it down pat. Well, at least no one wooed when she did it. But that was her finish before Great Khali. Corey, your thoughts on Muppets on Raw? Well, I was disappointed. I thought that Miss Piggy would beat the hell out of Kelly Kelly. I think that would be... Why the hell would she do that? She's a baby face. She's annoying, and she acts like a heel, and she snogged Kermit. Those are three very good reasons for Piggy to beat the hell out of her. I like Miss Piggy. But Although she's a baby. I. I I could have done without Miss Piggy trying to get in Morrison's pants. That was a bit wrong. But I'm sure Muppet bestiality is PG, right? Maybe they're trying to make it out like Melina's a pig. Oh, I no, they're not. I'm just making that up. I thought the Muppets were great. Every time they came on the screen, I found myself with a smile on my face before they even did anything. I just thought it was something that you wouldn't expect to see on a WWE show nowadays. You know, maybe in the 80s they could have pulled something like this off. And, uh, you know, it would have been Mean hilarious. With Gene the Bobby Heenan and... Yeah, yeah, exactly, stuff like that. And uh, But to do it on, on a live Raw, I thought it was brilliant. Kermit the Frog, just even the details of Kermit the Frog, how he looks scared shitless of Jack Swagger standing over him. <laughs> and uh, like you guys said with Beaker and Sheamus, I, I thought everything that had to do with the Muppets on that show was golden. They did it really well. I don't really get Corey's thoughts on Miss Piggy beating up Kelly Kelly. I think you just don't like Kelly Kelly, but uh, Clearly. Um, I... I I liked uh, Miss Piggy's interaction with Vicky Guerrero. I thought that was done much better. And uh, since, the, you know, Vicky Guerrero looks like a pig and stuff anyway. It was good. I thought it was great. As far as the wrestling part of the show, eh, I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, we'll about get Kermit getting bagged? That's what that was funny, too. What you're saying about Kermit the Frog and his reactions and everything, it may be aside, but fuck it. We're talking about the Muppets anyway. Whoever took over the role, and I'm sorry, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, for Jim Henson, as Kermit the Frog really had all of his mannerisms and everything down. And what's amazing is, if you think about it, the Muppets are inanimate cloth and stitched together pieces of clothing and or, or felt, and there's no life to it. You take the performer away, and it's just an inanimate object on a desk. But these performers... And, of course, them being the successors to Frank Oz and Jim Henson and true geniuses of puppetry have given those characters so much life. I don't think a lot of people even really notice or think about, even if they see Miss Piggy when she's rubbing John Morrison's abs with the stick holding her hand and everything. I really think people go into that realm of suspension of disbelief because they have given these characters so much life, so much personality, And there's so much feeling that goes behind it. And they don't give enough credit for that. So it's just an amazing thing that they do. And people in entertainment and movies and television, those really talented performers are able to give these creations. Maybe they should start writing Raw then because everyone almost seems – well, not everyone. I can't say everyone. There are a few that stand out. But you just see so many banal, cookie-cutter, personality-less characters – but 
at least they chose the right ones for them to interact with, like Santino and Cody Rhodes and whatever, and Vicky Guerrero. But at any rate, for the wrestling itself, though, outside of the Muppets portion, and I was pretty disappointed there was no Statler and Waldorf entire match that gets commentary from those two, because when they said, well, The Miz is up next, well, it's a good thing you can't see. <laughs> oh, man, that that was just great. <laughs> maybe a little too real <laughs> that maybe that was one of those comments that was a shoot that wasn't supposed to be <laughs> or at least taken the wrong way anyway but what you were saying will earlier about we want to like this stuff but we just fucking can't boy did i fucking feel that about this show now it's what we felt when we left the leah Coors center in philadelphia with tna and how am i supposed to enjoy this show when shit just makes no sense. I hate this fucking expression. We'll just sit back and enjoy it. No, asshole. As soon as I hear the word just, I know this is coming. Because I'm supposed to tear my brain off and just enjoy it. Or we know too much. We can't enjoy it anymore because we know too much about the product. Fucking no. We just talked about a few shows ago. Mark Henry and his title push. And why do people like it? Because it's fucking simple. It's, I dare say, old school, but it's simple and it works. Excuse me. Excuse me! For expecting stories to make sense. For there to be continuity. And for things to be treated in a proper way. We just talked about the mid-card titles before. Well, uh, how is it? That CM Punk is facing Mark Henry in a match. Mark Henry is the world heavyweight champion, yet if Punk wins this match, he gets a title shot against the other champion. Da! It makes my fucking head explode. I just don't understand some of this shit. Now, a lot of people were complaining about Cena and The Rock, right? Rock had this pre tape promo, and what they were saying was, why would John Cena even need The Rock as a tag partner at the pay-per-view now. I know he was forced to choose one, but why does he even need a tag partner, so they're saying, when he can beat up Awesome Truth by himself? I just don't understand how this shit gets booked sometimes. And I know everyone was all hopeful about the CM Punk angle over the summer, and everyone's disappointed now. But God damn it, Will Brooks, We like you were saying, we want to like wrestling. We want to like these products. But this shit just makes no fucking sense. So, like Jay was alluding to, and we'll get back to you, Jay, but just your thoughts on the rest of the show, the non-Muppets portion, Will Brooks. It kind of felt like to me like they overbooked it like they always do. Cena and Mitt didn't start until like five outs. Or mm-hmm. Actually, maybe like even a little after that. The matches themselves weren't that bad. I wasn't too thrilled about who went over. It seemed like every champion lost last night, which I didn't understand because the champions are supposed to look strong, or at least at least until going into this pay per view. So I couldn't understand why they all lost, but they did. Yeah, it made no sense. A punk, if he beats one champion, faces another champion. Why wouldn't he just be the champion? He just beat the guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did like the fact that CM Punk put Del Rio into a submission and made him get a title shot. I thought that was kind of cool. You don't see that that often. Well, well, yes, I have a hard time following too. It just Wrestling is turned into TV. It's turned into, like, episodic TV. And sometimes what TV shows like to do is shock you. They like to, like, surprise you. Like, oh, you thought we were going that way. We're going left. You thought you were going north. You're going south. It's nice to have that every now and then, but in wrestling, we like continuity. We like to understand, like, a guy gets built up. Yes, we want to see that baby face beat the shit out of the heel. We want to see that tag team who's been around for so long win the titles eventually. We want to see all this stuff. Yes, it's cheesy. Yes, we've all seen it before, but damn it, it works because it's good. It's been proven to work, and we love it. Why the fuck would you change something that works? I don't get it. The attitude era is over. Can we just go back to like old school mainstream wrestling? Can, like, just, can we just go back to what it's supposed to be, not what it was? Ugh. Corey, what do you think about what we've been saying about the non-Muppet portion of Raw? I have to agree. I want to bring up somebody that just said something brilliant in the chat room. Doc Destro said the show wasn't interesting at all because they followed a pay-per-view with something that was almost a throwaway episode when they're supposed to be building the next pay-per-view. In other words, it existed in a bubble almost in and of itself, regardless of whatever pay-per-view came before and after it. I have to agree with them on that. I mean, I watch Raw every week just so I can stay current when we do the show. Just but to push yourself into a mental asylum even further? <laughs> it seems 
that way. It seems like nobody wants to follow a coherent storyline that makes any sense. And just like TNA, WWE seems interested in overcomplicating storylines and dropping storylines right when they're starting to be good. For title contention storylines, we don't need contract signings. We don't need to hear Triple H's opinion or Johnny Ace's opinion. We just need one wrestler with a belt and another wrestler that says, I want the pretty belt. I don't see what's so difficult about booking something like that. We have storylines that fall through the cracks, and we've got people on television that just aren't believable anymore. Like, for example, there's been talk on Twitter. Oh, come like, on. Like Jake the Snake luring Warrior into the graveyard and then into the snake room where he gets bit and Undertaker betrays him was realistic. Well, that wasn't realistic Holy. either. But at the very least, Jake the Snake could back up what he said. If Jake the Snake says prior to his big bad drug problems, if Jake the Snake back then were to tell you, I'm going to get in the ring and kick your ass, you believe it. You believe this guy's going to fuck you up. That was believable. If Ultimate Warrior says, I'm going to smack your face off, you probably believe that. But nowadays, we don't have too many believable people. We have these feminine characters coming on television. We've got this baby-faced Cody Rhodes. I can take Randy Orton. No, you cannot. You're a child, and you have no knee pads. We have all these guys that are over-groomed, over-feminized, Nobody's going to buy into that. Nobody's believing these guys as competitors, and none of them seems to have a coherent storyline. How many guys are on this roster that will have a feud for all of two weeks, and then by the next pay-per-view it's forgotten? We see this with Brian every week now. He has not had one consistent feud this entire year. We see oh, come on, Corey, like we see Brian every week. Ho-ho! Oh! On the occasion that we do, he has no consistent storyline. We have two weeks of him fighting Heath Slater, one week with Tyson Kidd. This week he's fighting Mark Henry. Week after that, we've got two weeks of Wade Barrett, and then the cycle continues. There's no consistency here. And when you have no consistency and no coherency with the storyline writing or with these matches, so many of them now ending with schmazz fests, like all of Triple H's matches lately. Has he had one match where there's been a finish to it? No, we've had every match where Miz and R-Truth jump in, or Johnny Ace comes out, or somebody else jumps in the ring for no apparent reason. Like, a wrestler comes back and says, oh, I dropped my contact, oh, you happen to have a match, well, let me kick your ass here, too. Well, come on, Corey, we're talking about a promotion that last week announced Michael Cole and Jim Ross and then didn't have time for it. It's almost like they're flying by the seat of their pants. Jay, your thoughts on, I guess, Raw last night outside of the Muppets and what we've been talking about? The thing about the Jim Ross, Michael Cole thing is that was one of the things I was looking forward to on Raw because I watched SmackDown the other night. Michael Cole was talking about it all night long, how he's going <laughs> to kick JR's ass and all this shit. And they don't have the match. I did not understand it. I watched football last night and went back and I went through Raw today. And, Hard uh, subject was, to change. Was, yeah, I thought I called in because I thought we were talking about Tim Tebow. But anyway, just kidding. There was good, bad, and ugly about Raw. I didn't get how they threw Cody Rhodes and Wade Barrett together as a tag team all of a sudden to go against Air Boom. Didn't make any sense. I've been behind Cody Rhodes. I think they got something with him acting like a psycho. He does a really good job at that where he's kind of like he gets these weird facial expressions and laughs to himself. And I think they got something with that. I didn't get Alberto Del Rio in the big show. That, that just like... Slow paced, you know, I understand you're having Punk versus Henry, so you're going to have naturally Big Show versus Del Rio, but the match sucked. Like Will said, they're overthinking themselves and they do it every fucking week. Uh, mm. it, it's a simple, wrestling is a pretty simple formula, and you just have to really put entertaining storylines around it. You don't have to reach, so to speak, and they seem to be doing that every single week. People like Zack Ryder, give us Zack Ryder, and they did that. That is something that's simple. Everybody right. behind him, you put him with Dolph Ziggler, they're going to have a good match. They kind of have a feud, but wait a second. You put Dolph Ziggler against Mason Ryan. You're building Dolph and Zach for the U.S. title for a few weeks. All of a sudden, Mason Ryan's involved. doesn't make any sense. It's stuff like that that boggles my mind, and I'm sure it boggles the mind of every nine-year-old kid that watches the show, too, because it just doesn't make any goddamn sense. As far as the main event is concerned with John Cena and Miz, the Rock's involved with the Masters of Rider Series. I'm pumped for that. I'm going to that. But I understand the fact that John Cena can kick both their asses, and it really doesn't make any sense to have The Rock involved at all in this match. You're going to build heat. That's what you want to do. You want to get The Rock some ring time. I understand it. That makes sense to me. 
But are Miz and, and our truth really a threat to them? Absolutely not at this point. I don't think they've done enough of these guys to make you believe that they can take either one of them. John Laurinaitis, he just seems uncomfortable out there. I don't know if it's meant to be that way. It probably is. But he just doesn't seem like he's great in his on-air role. And I hope it leads to something where they finally discover that he's been backstabbing Triple H the whole time. They're overthinking themselves in general. I guess there's a reason why we haven't seen Johnny Ace on TV in the 10 years he's been there until now. But you were saying about Simple. Look at CM Punk. It's a simple fucking character. Tattooed, straight-edge, elitist prick. They turned it into this whole anti-WWE this year. He's upset he's leaving, whatever. How does it end up where it is now? The worst was, to me, Nash text himself. I still don't understand what the fuck that means. Gerald Bynum in Mississippi. Hey, Gerald. I'm in agreement with everybody else about Raw, that the Muffets are great, and the rest of Raw is very underwhelming. I like uh, Piggy and Kermit segment with Kelly Kelly. That'd be the same way I'd have it with meeting one of the divas. Yeah, it'd be bliss when we meet them, but then I'd catch hell from my lady. And Sounds then like a- everyone's agreeing that the best part of the wrestling show last night had nothing to do with the wrestling itself. It seemed like it was actually like watching the episode of The Muppets from back in the day, and then like Raw was guest starring on this show, you know. That's really what it seemed like. Um, and, and I agree with you about, I hate that BS of just sit back and enjoy. I mean, I'm like you. Things need to make sense. Things need to be coherent. Things need to be consistent. It's simple business. I'm a paying customer. You pretty much know what I paid to see, so just give me what I paid for. Prime example, Bounce of Glory didn't do that. Give me what I paid to see. And it's like they're trying to reinvent the wheel, and it gets ridiculous. It's been working all this time, and there was no signs of it not working as far as we pay to see the face beat the heel eventually, so give us that. And I agree with Corey about the knee pads. I mean, I feel like Ric Flair... And Big Show about the only ones that I can tolerate not wearing knee pads. <laughs> I think everyone's spending too much time looking at wrestlers' knees. Royce in Pomona, California, you're on. Eric, I, I mostly agree with um, what everybody's saying about Raw, about how the Muppets were like really the highlights of the show, which is kind of like, I I would say not ironic, but yeah, I guess, I guess you could say but ironic. Sad. Uh, yeah, ironic how like a lifeless cloth has more personality and fairy characters than actual human beings. But... <laughs> But yeah, you say about how consistency and all that, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but isn't that kind of how the Attitude Era got over by just being messy? And I know it's different characters and different time and blah, 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 but isn't that what happened Like when Vince is helping The Rock win the championship after screwing him, the whole pay-per-view, and Rikishi run over Austin because he thought The Rock was being held down even though Vince helped him, and people's penises getting chopped off, and this and that. People complain about inconsistency, but it's been here for 10 years. And it's right. just seems like now you, you, you like realize it. It just makes no sense how, because it's like Cena evolved it instead of some guy tricking beer. It's wrong now. Top stars being people. Was it in 99 where Austin beat Big Show on Raw? And no one raised the eyebrow to that. I did. They, they, well, yeah, you, we didn't well, have an internet talk show back then. <laughs> Yeah, so they should have saw something coming back then, but they don't, and it's been the same. And yeah. Well, you don't understand, man. It was a different time. Back then, we believed in the day what the hell they were doing. And for the most part, at the time, I think they still did. Everything, it was rude, yeah, though. it was congested, but it was still linear plot lines that were going along with everything. Now, but, you don't, we don't have that. The only people that have linear plot lines are usually the main adventures. And now, their, their plot lines don't even make a whole hell of a lot of sense anymore. It was a different time then, man. I understand what you're saying. But, yeah, we should have seen the writing on the wall. But at the time, we had no reason to think of this. It's the one point that Vince Russo always made whenever I saw him do an interview. Is he always said that he was given a list of the roster, and he had to come up with a story for every single guy in the roster, no matter who it was, no matter if it was Brown or fucking Chaz. It didn't matter. He had to come up with some kind of story for every single one of them in case they were needed. And that's what they did back then, although it didn't make any fucking sense. It was a roller coaster ride. It was a crash course. But it, the fact is, it's just different now. Raw is no cookie cutter. It's the same exact presentation every week. The CM Punk thing in the summer, they had something going there, we thought. But, uh, of course, Triple H stole his thunder, and, and it's gone downhill. I'm not going to stop watching the show. I'm going to keep giving it chances. But who knows what's going to happen? You just don't know. It's probably going to continue to be a clusterfuck until this whole John Lord night of storyline plays out and they move on to something different. Well, I've said it before to Royce when this has come up that you take away the beer and alcohol and drugs, the blood and the cursing, and it's pretty much still the spirit of the Attitude Era. That style of booking in TV hasn't really gone away in 10 years. I really don't think it's that different per se. 
if we want to go into analysis of what Russo actually did, let's say in 99, we could, but we're running out of time. And before we run out of time, we have one more call. Is it Ronnie in California? Uh, what's up, man? You're from Houston, man. What's going on, man? Houston, excuse me. Ronnie in Houston, you're on, and we only have a minute or so. so. Yeah, I'm kind of mad how they turned one of the best angles in years, and Triple A kind of hijacked it and turned it into his little comeback special for the winner or whatever. That, that, that kind of sucked. But Raw, it's a family show. I still watch it, but, but last night was the worst, man. Why was it the worst? I grew up liking the up. It's cool and everything, but it just the way the way that show was and everything else. And then Atlanta, then the whole arena wasn't filled. It was maybe like half filled last night. It was it's was pretty. I mean, during the stage, they got to really think about what they're gonna do in, in the following months, man. Because I don't, I don't know how this new this thing, this little nice story is not gonna go and last. Well, maybe instead of Brian Gewertz writing Raw, they should get Brian Henson. Maybe things will make a little more sense then. But we're running out of time, and we're going to be off the air. So join us next time in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about UFC's first show on Fox, UFC on Fox number one, as well as TNA Turning Point 2011. Join us on WrestlingRoundTable.com, and join us on their message board. Follow us on Twitter. We're still on MySpace for you who are still there. iTunes, go fight live as well, and look at our archives here on Blog Talk Radio. And, of course, subscribe to us on YouTube. So for the panel of Jay Aletto, welcome back. Don't be a stranger, Will Brooks, Amira in Baltimore, and Corey in Chicago. Happy birthday once again, Corey. Enjoy it. You're only eight once, so enjoy it. I'm Eric Santa Maria. Join us next time on Wrestling Roundtable Radio. 